Thank you, Tim. I'm so pleased to be here with our newest Upwork collab partner, chef, author, and TV personality, Kristen Kish. For those that do not know, Kristen was born in South Korea and adopted into a family from Kentwood, Michigan. At an early age, she showed an affinity for cooking and her mother suggested she go to culinary school. And since attending the Codon Bleu in Chicago, Kristen never looked back. She's competed on season 10 of Bravo's Top Chefs where she won the title, becoming the second female chef to win the competition. In 2017, she launched her first cookbook, Kristen Kish Cooking. And a year later, she partnered with the Sedell Group to open her first restaurant, Arlo Gray in Austin, Texas. Currently, she is the co-host of the TV series, Fast Foodies on True TV. And in our chat today, I am super, super, super thrilled to be talking to Kristen about her journey as an entrepreneur, her approach to building diverse, high-performing teams, and to learn more about how she's planning to partner with freelancers on our platform, Upwork, to raise awareness for the LGBTQ plus youth community. Kristen, welcome. We are honored to have you here. Hi, how are you? Thank you for having me. <laughs> of course, of course. All right, so let's dive right in. I want you to kind of take yourself back as a, a young kid in Michigan. Do you think you could have imagined all of your success to date, restaurant owner, author, TV host, a married woman? You know, I, it's funny. I think back to, and it's a conversation my mom and I have semi-regularly, um, kind of to give you a scope of, I guess, the direction and the expectation and, I guess, people's guesses of where I would where I would become. I remember, so, you know, as you're a kid, my brother, you know, we always went to the orthodontist. It was just what we did. And, you know, it, it's, you know, you get the choice. Do you want braces or not? Or do you not want braces? And I still remember my mom told me this many, many years later that when we went to the orthodontist, our family orthodontist said, well, I mean, she's, it's fine. Her teeth are fine, but um, it's not like she's going to be on TV or anything. So really she could get away without having braces. And so like that whole idea, and I, I don't think it's, that your parents don't ever think that you're going to become this TV person. It's just, it's not something, it's not even a place that my brain allowed me to even think for myself, um, especially growing up in, in Michigan, being socially awkward, social anxiety, kind of very shy, more introverted than anything. Um, and so for me, thinking back of being who I am now, um, I mean, I, I couldn't ever, ever imagined it for myself. Is, I mean, if, if you were to go back and ask your, your young self, what did you want to be when you grew okay. up? So a, a, as a young Kristen, I was very surely unsure of myself. And so as a kid, I was always reaching for the things that I thought I was supposed to do. I wasn't fully self-informed. I wasn't aware of who I am and what I wanted to be. Um, so, you know, you took those tests in, in, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school that, you know, you went to like the social counselor. I don't even know what they call them these days, um, where you do this online thing and it's like pops up and tells you exactly what you should be for the rest of your life. Um, and I remember doing those tests semi-frequently. And depending on what I thought was cool at the moment, I would answer the questions to give me that final outcome. So I wanted to be everything from a CPA, which I nearly failed out of math, so that would have never worked. Um, I wanted to be an international business because that's what I thought would allow me the most travel um, and to see the world. Um, I wanted to be a marine biologist because I thought swimming was cool. I wanted to be an architect because I was like, ooh, that's cool. That sounds like a fun job. Meanwhile, I don't have the skills to do any of those things at, at all. I just thought they looked kind of cool. And so it really honestly wasn't until long after culinary school, I was like, oh wait, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is what I love to do. And this is where I feel the most confident feeling not confident about what I'm doing, if that makes sense. Because I feel like, um, when you have the ability to go into this field of work and you also have the ability to understand that you don't know everything about it and that you actually have to work for it and you have to learn, I feel like that's when those two pieces come together where you're confidently not confident almost. Um, 
I feel like that's, for me, that was the lane I was supposed to be in. No, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Kind of going into, you know, not feeling confident, but confident as a bad, you know, I, I guess I can't say that word, but you know, an awesome boss entrepreneur, what is something that, you know, looking back now, you wish you would have told yourself or advice that you would give folks that are kind of wanting to get into entrepreneurship and things like that? You know, what was the thing for me was, is I, it, it was a conscious decision to go from working for someone to then going into my own lane. Um, but I remember it wasn't because I was like, oh, I need to work for myself now and I, this is what I want to do. It was because I was working for other chefs in a restaurant and the job that I decided to leave was for a multitude of different reasons, none of which included, oh, I think it's time that I just go out on my own. Um, it was almost like this forced avenue where I was like, well, this doesn't feel good anymore and I don't really like it. And I think that there are a lot of things that aren't just working for me personally that are a little bit too... Nothing was wrong, but it wasn't right for me. Um, and so I literally made the decision. I woke up one day and I was like, I'm going in today and I'm going to quit because that's what I have to do. Um, and it, I, and I, I did it and I knew it was time because it was just such a struggle to wake up every single day and go into this job. And so, um, you know, I think you go through different feelings. Like at first I felt guilty. I was like, how dare I leave a position that I was promoted into, that someone believed in me, that they wanted me in here. And I'm not doing a bad job, but, I, but for me, I wasn't doing the greatest job that I could. Um, and so you go from like guilt for leaving and wanting to leave a great job um, to second guessing everything. But listen, I was very fortunate to already have I was working full time for someone else, but I was also having all these like side hustles come in because because of Top Chef. So it wasn't a complete blind leap into like a, a dark hole. Um, I, I, I was sort of already venturing into that direction. So I was very fortunate in that way. But um, I don't know. I always say that we as human beings always have a gut instinct. We have, we have a feeling. There's always something that's like, uh, and now it's time. It goes from, should I quit my job to, I have to quit my job or whatever the, whatever the question is um, that's being questioned. But I think for me, it was just, I knew it. I just knew it and it's so hard to explain. Um, and I know it's this, this, this paragraph of information that people want to have that's like, how did you do it? And I'm like, I don't know. And I just, I guess I didn't think about it too much. Well, that's fantastic. Maybe I should stop thinking too much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a cro I'm a chronic overthinker. And so when I overthink too much, I can literally convince myself out of the greatest opportunity. So almost it's kind of like um, allowing muscle memory and your instinct to kick in just for a second. Um, you know, you got to do it right because sometimes that can lead you down the wrong path as it used to do for me. But uh, I don't know. For me, it worked. And I think timing was everything. Yeah, no, I, I think that's fantastic advice for, for folks that kind of want to take that that extra leap into something that might feel unknown, um, but they're very passionate about it. Um, so kind of talking about, you know, the, the road travel to where you are today. Can you talk us through, you know, what are some folks that may have provided support, mentors to you? I mean, if at all, maybe you, you know, did it yourself. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't think any, I don't think anyone makes it themselves. Like there is, there is a whole crew and band of people behind you of people that you've known maybe for 10 minutes and people that you've known your entire life. So obviously my family and my parents, without them, I wouldn't have been able to have a backup plan. Like if I were to go out there and mess up, I knew that my parents were there. Right. And I knew I could go home and I knew that they would help me. Um, so again, I definitely recognize the, the luxury in, in having that support, um, you know, chef mentors and cooks, not even just always the big boss. Sometimes it's like you, the, the person that you're, you know, cooking right next to on the line during like a 500 person service and you're getting each other through it. Um, it's that. And it's also, um, I remember after winning Top Chef, I got all these great messages from, from people in the Asian American community and people in the LGBTQ community. And I didn't recognize that I was able to be part of those communities or that I would be embraced by 
um, that they were available to me to feel comfort in, to be surrounded by people like me, um, also the ad ad adoptee community. Uh, so I would say those folks, um, whether it was a DM or whether it was I met you in person and I talked to you for five minutes, those people are also uh, what I consider mentors to me as well. And, and I, I think that's a, a fantastic segue into diversity because you just kind of hit on the LGBTQ plus community, Asian, being Asian American, but growing up in the United States. Can you talk to me a little bit more about, you know, the importance of a diverse team? I, I hear you guys have at Arlo Gray over 60 percent women on your teams like can you talk to me a little bit more about the importance that you feel of diversity you know i think it's something that i've learned along the way um, obviously i am who i am and i am a lot of minority boxes checked i guess in a lot of ways um, but it's something i guess growing up as a kid like i knew i was i knew i was adopted i knew i looked different than other people um, and then when I came out, I knew that's also like a whole nother s section of things. And then adopt being adopted, I guess, again, never really thinking about that I was, but then all of a sudden being recognized by other people in the community that also are like, hey, you're like me. And I'm like, wait a minute. Oh my God, you're like me too. And so it was almost like this, this shared experience of, of camaraderie that I needed to hear that I was part of it, which allowed me to step more into it. Um, you know, I think it's, I think we've all learned how to pay attention more and how to activate change and diversity in our own lives. Um, I certainly also am a student in all of that. And so, you know, specifically for Arlo Gray, I remember when we first started and I was like, you know what, I grew up in, in kitchens with all men and very, very few women aside from like the pastry department. And I was like, you know, this, is, this isn't gonna work for me. And so it was a very conscious decision to actively pay attention more to all the women coming to apply. Now again, obviously you have to have skill, you gotta be good at your job, you gotta do all these things. Um, but it was also just like paying attention more. And I think that was really important lessons for me to learn. And so that being said, I also think just by being who I am, being like, hey, we're hiring, I'm going to get like-minded, like people coming to me for a multitude of different reasons. Is it because they're like, great, you know, women chefs want to go work for another woman chef. So I've already, I don't have to advertise that I'm looking for women. I am a woman and they will come to me. Um, so I think it was a relatively simple process by getting people in the door. Um, and then it was really just about me then being very aware of, um, how who who to bring in right when you have a sea of people um and then you just gotta start to you have to actively choose the the right people in order to make the best diverse team so um i don't want to say it was easy for me but i think that when people present themselves i was fortunate to have a a, a, a very diverse group of people present themselves to me when opening our logo any advice that you would have for like owners, managers um, that are looking to build diverse teams and uh, almost pressure I, test like how yeah. they they view things today? Well, I think that if you're looking for if you're looking for a a diverse group of people and you just aren't seeing people come to you, I think a couple things need to happen. I think one, it's well, what does that say about you that perhaps certain people don't really feel the want or the need to want to come work for you. That's one question. So you do have to look at your own responsibility and look internally of, of how could I be better to actually generate a little bit more interest. Secondly, if that's not happening, um, then I think one of the greatest things that a lot of companies have done are hire you know, diversity managers and you have people that help you guide through. And this is you know, it's something I've always said, it's a, whether we're talking about diversity or whether we're talking about just how to help in general, sometimes when I see a problem or an issue, I get so overwhelmed that I can't, that I'm like, I don't even know where to start. So like, what do you even do? Um, and so then things like Upwork, which I honestly learned about very recently through this partnership, 
um, is that there are so many people out there that know so much more that can help you. And so I think it's just reaching out and you have to tap into other people that just know more about things than you do. Yeah, no, that's great. So let's dig into the partnership with Upwork. Can you tell us a little bit more about the project um, that you'll be working on through the Upwork CoLab program? So this was a really exciting process for me because again, like I've said, for many years, it's like, how, what more can I do? How, how can I utilize my skill set, but like help and activate different change and thoughts and, and generate conversations beyond myself? Um, obviously, I can't do it by myself because I know, I know a lot about a very small subject, which is cooking <laughs> and kitchens. Um, and so to think about how great we could take this throughout the brainstorming. I mean, there are several different conversations and ideas being had. But one thing is when I think back to my childhood and when I think about what really helped me as a chef and also as an individual, um, it's this idea of journaling, right? And I think a lot of people will all find, will find something in journaling, whether you go to school and you take pages and pages of notes so you can go home and study, whatever it is, whatever is in our brain, oftentimes we do need to get out somewhere. So whether it's a piece of paper or whether it's drawing pictures, whether it's art, um, it, it, whether conversation with other people around you. Um, and so when we were thinking about the, the restaurant and the artwork that we wanted to convey, someone brought up and was like, well, God, you guys always have so many notebooks of just ideas. And I was like, oh my God, I have boxes and boxes of random notebooks, pages torn out, random scribbles, things crossed out, recipes that didn't work, like notes that I needed to take for myself. Um, and so thinking of that idea, I was like, okay, great. So how can we take that idea and push it into aiming it towards kids and adolescents to challenge the way they think, to activate um, a response that's not just like, hey, I tried this and it worked, yay, let's move on, or hey, I tried this idea and it didn't work, but how did I feel after? And I think that's just that next step. Um, we're, we're all gonna try stuff that doesn't work. I had recipes crossed out that just don't work, but it was like, what, could I have done earlier on in my career that I think would have helped me more as an individual is why didn't it work and start to unpack that. So you, you know the points of, of failure, right? Where it was like, well, that didn't work. Let's, let's learn from it and move on. And that's something we always say, um, learn from your mistakes. So taking that idea, adding it into recipes, right? So a recipe and then it was like, choose your own adventure of a few different ingredients try adding this ingredient to a cookie recipe. And then the kid tries it and they're like, yeah, I didn't really like adding spinach to my cookie, but how did I feel afterwards? And just, the, and just activating and encouraging um, a conversation within your own self. Yeah, no, that, that's pretty cool. It almost um, reminded me of a time where my younger sister, um, you know, in kindergarten, they had to provide the family recipe and she didn't even bother asking my mom, but I remember when we got the, the recipe book back, she made an Asian dish called Tiger Tear. And she told them that they needed to cook their steak at 5,000 degrees for 50 hours. <laughs> and I was like, oh goodness. Um, but no, that's, 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 that's fantastic. What, um, you know, when everything is all complete and you have this cookbook, you know, what is success to you? And like, why is this so important to you? I, I know you had mentioned about like having kids kind of expand their mind, but once this is released, what, what is success for you? I think success is just even having one person being like, wow, that was really great. It doesn't even need to be this whole crazy, like, oh, I had this great internal conversation with myself and like I ripped out pages and I figured out so much about me. It could be as something as, hey, I tried that recipe and I really liked it. I think success um, is oftentimes seen as like these grand, these grand landmarkers of, of moments in our life. But I think the successes, the true successes are the ones that get us from A to maybe A and a half and that just keep helping us progress. And whether that's going forward, sideways, backwards, it doesn't really matter. Um, just as long as there's a little bit of movement happening. And I think for me, that's 
that's it. I also think that there's great success in even just having the conversation about making it. I think there's great success in even just having um, it hit one person or even just saying, hey, we did it amongst myself and then, you know, the, the freelance team. So, I mean, so many different successes. I think there's going to be several throughout the entire process. No, that, that's awesome. Um, so I know we've mentioned like the, the freelancers and leveraging the freelancers on the Upwork platform. You had mentioned before about, you know, not knowing that all of these people are out there. What, what else are you kind of hoping for like freelancers to come and support your project that you really want to tap into? You know, I think as much as, you know, they're all going to come and help me on this, this idea. I think even just sitting down and being able to have conversations with people that I would not have ever normally had conversations with maybe or my past wouldn't have crossed with them is that, yeah, we're going to be working on this one thing, but I guarantee you so many different ideas in our own spaces. I'll walk away having been challenged and inspired by something maybe they say, maybe something they do, a passion that they have, um, and hopefully vice versa. That has nothing to do with this one project. So I think it's just the ability to learn from other people. And like I said before, I know a lot about a little thing. Um, and these people are, whether you're a writer or you've self-published a book, I have a cookbook, but I had a team of people helping me activate and getting it out there. So I think, you know, just there's so many, there's so many side conversations that will be had during this just, you know, this one project. So I think that's really exciting because how, how fun is it to be able to have conversations with people that don't do what you do, but you're all kind of working towards the same goal? And then what happens beyond that? I think the unknown is, is a very exciting place for me. That's awesome. Um, and so for all those freelancers out there that are joining us virtually, I'm happy to share that the application page to join Kristen's Dream Team will be live on September 7th through the 14th. So please be on the lookout um, and, and supporting, you know, our, our collab program. Uh, super, super excited help. about it. I really need help. <laughs> none, of, none of this is going to happen if I don't have any help. So um, I really look forward to, to seeing who, who is equally as excited about it as I am. That's awesome. Um, all right. So now some personal questions that I'm sure some folks are dying to know. We have a few folks on um, that and our Upwork community, which is an up and out uh, belonging community who I, I've been reading, I've been fangirling about having you here um, at, at this conference with us. Um, so I know you got married in April, so congratulations. Uh, you're nearly five months in. What's the best thing about being married so far? God, that's a... That's a big question. So I'll, I'll back up a little bit and I, I will fully admit that I never thought that I would get married. Not because I didn't think I'd find a partner, it's just because the, I also was really bitter at the institution of marriage for a long time because it was like for a long time, I wasn't allowed to get married to who I loved. And so like the whole idea and then, you know, you know, a man and a woman being able to go to Vegas and get married and then divorced 12 hours later really rubbed me the wrong way. I said, well, what's the point of institutional marriage if, if people can do things like this? But I'm not allowed to get married to, to someone I love. Anyway, so I was bitter for quite some time and I, I think a lot of it stemmed from a fear, to, if I'm being honest. So I think it went from like bitter and like the reality of what it was to, you know, actively leaning into that because I was also scared that I wasn't gonna find someone, right? So I think there was a, there was a dissection of who I am and what I wanted kind of battling a little bit. Um, meanwhile, I grew up with my, my family. My parents have just recently-ish celebrated their 50 years together. So I came, I come from a very um, important family that where marriage basically means forever. And I, and I, and I, that was, used to be scary to me, but it now kind of isn't. Um, anyway, so eventually when you find the right person, you're like, oh, dang, okay. So when it goes, crosses over from being in a relationship to fiancés to then getting married, everything shifts. And there's just this, it's a calm, right? There's, of course, there's excitement, this idea of the future and all this stuff. But for me, it was just calm and certain, if that makes sense. So, um, and confident, 
I'm like, okay, well, you know, I'm confident that I want to always try to be the best partner for my wife and vice versa. So it's like, we're going to do this together. And I think there's, there's confidence in partnership. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm assuming you do most of the cooking or, I, do. <laughs> I, do. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, yeah. is it a competition or no, 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 no. no. Okay. No. Okay. No, she, she's very happy if I do the cooking whenever I'm home, uh, I'd, I'd say 90% of the time I do I do the cooking. When I'm obviously not home, she certainly knows how to cook for herself and feed herself. Um, but you know, every so often, especially if I'll travel and she's home, or if we if the roles are reversed and I'm at home and she's traveling for work and she comes home, um, it's fun to to be able to cook for someone. So she'll she'll take the role sometimes, and then I will as well. But for the majority, the normal nights and dinner on the table, it's usually me. Okay. Okay. So uh, talking about uh, cooking again, um, I, I was reading an article where you had mentioned that folks, you know, will take you for face value and assume that, oh, well, she's going to cook something Asian. Oh, can, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> can, can you talk to me about maybe what some of your favorite dishes are that you like to cook? Yeah, I mean, I love making homemade pasta. I, I came up in French and Italian kitchens. My my longest, even still current mentor um, is heavily rooted in Italian cooking and the storytelling of like rustic Italian cuisine. And so I fell in love with that because that's what I was taught. And it's also something that felt really natural to me. And it also helped me aid, um, it anchored a technique in which helped me allow like help me tell my own story through food and my story through food is midwestern upbringing and so a lot of times that comes from you know box foods or you know different ba uh, barbecue salads that we'd have in summer in michigan or you know the michigan corn that i'm obsessed with and i don't know meatloaf i don't know beef stroganoff all the midwestern hearty good foods um that's that's where my story comes from so not that I'm neglecting my, my Asian roots and Asian cooking, but I also didn't grow up with that. And I also didn't grow up eating a lot of it. And I wasn't taught how to make that food. So it didn't come, I guess, as second nature to me as, as you know, other styles of cooking. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that completely makes sense. So Kristen, this has been a phenomenal conversation. Um, one one thing that I personally took away is just the power of leaning into who you are and, and owning it. And I, I, I really did like the piece about, you know, confidence. You might not be confident going into the situation, but if you are confident, you know, you'll, you'll ultimately end up succeeding and making it who you are and, and what it is. Um, I, I really do appreciate uh, the time and, and sharing your story with us today. Um, I do want to put in one additional plug look out for the application coming out in two weeks to support Kristen's team. Um, but I'll pass it over to Tim to introduce the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.